Pokemon Yellow Legacy is a ROM hack that helps Pokemon Yellow reach its full potential, while still feeling like yellow. It's not technically a difficulty hack, but it is more difficult than the Kanto games for sure. Pokemon have new stat spreads, new movesets, and new spawn locations, and the trainer AI is all improved. This keeps Yellow Legacy feeling fresher than ever, and today I'll be doing a hardcore Nuzlocke from start to finish. And I won't be boxing the starter Pikachu once. This little guy is going to be taken all the way to the end of the Elite Four, whether he likes it or not. My first partner Pikachu joins my party, and I bestow upon him the nickname, Coin. Coin and I fight my rival Blue for the first time, and this fight is pretty important as its verdict helps decide what team Blue ends up choosing. We end up narrowly getting the win, and Coin is... uninterested? Huh, I guess something was missing for him. With the world of Kanto fully realized, I carefully step into Route 1, ready for anything. The grass starts shaking, and our very first encounter ends up being... Rattata. Well, welcome in, book. Immediately after, I get the second encounter, and thanks to the old rod being available in the Viridian Pokemart, I'm able to fish up a Poliwag. This little guy will be super important for Brock, whose team is no joke without a water type now. I nickname him Stamps, and go on to get the next few encounters. These include Beanie Baby the Nidoran on Route 22, Pebble the Pidgey on Route 2, and Bugs the Metapod in Viridian Forest. Honestly, a pretty great selection of Pokemon, of whom I used to fight Blue in our rematch. Before the battle, I grind up my Pokemon on Wild Encounters to help begin building stat experience. Basically, this game's version of EVs. And then we charge in. Blue forgot this hack is based off of Yellow version and leads with Sparrow. Unsurprisingly, it goes down pretty quickly thanks to Coin, but not before getting off a Leer. Eevee then tags in and Coin quickly paralyzes them, but switches into Bugs on a Tail Whip. They then have a back and forth with Tackles and Confusions, and they honestly do some pretty heavy damage. Book then saves the day and cleans up with a quick attack, winning us the second rival battle. This inciting event ends up having a larger impact on the run than I thought it would. Since we won the first two fights, Blue is now going to be choosing the hard mode route and building his team around his soon-to-be Jolteon. But the butterfly effect is something that only really happens with time travel. If I'm just living in the present, then surely the consequences won't be realized. Right? Continuing my journey to Brock, I head through the Viridian Forest, battling every trainer for the stat experience. With the help of Pebble and Bug, it's mostly no issue. But then, blocking the exit is a single undodgeable trainer. The first of their two Pokemon... is Pinsir? Oh boy. Well, Beanie Baby is pretty tired from the previous fights, so I send in Coin. They just use Harden for the switch, so we could paralyze and growl them over and over. Soon they set up a fully functional focus energy. So Bugs comes in on... a Harden. Okay, uh, I don't know if they even have any attacking moves, but that was way more stress than I needed this early on. Brock is a somewhat similar story. Not only do his Pokemon actually have stab moves, but attacks like Constrict got a damage boost, and Onyx has an actually usable stat spread. I'm just hoping Stamps can carry. Brock leads with his trusty Geodude, so Stamps leads strongly with a 4 times effective Bubble. That only does half. Yeah. So, Bubble got nerfed to only have 10 base power for early game balance. And you know what? I welcome it. After taking a tackle, another Bubble does the job and brings out Onyx. This time, our Bubble does maybe a quarter and constrict crits, bringing Stamps down to 12. I really wish we could stay in, but I'm not risking cute little Stamps. Okay, maybe one more. Alright, I'm out. Beanie Baby takes the field, but before we could use Double Kick, the Onyx lands a Screech. Given their damage buffs, I don't want to risk it and use Bugs to help get some chip damage and pivot back to Beanie Baby. From there, the Constricts aren't doing too much, and a Double Double Kick earns us the very first Gym Badge. Nice! Brock's Gym has been pretty basic for so many years now, but if Yellow Legacy made this fight this engaging, then I can't wait to see what the rest of this game has to offer. How do you feel, Coin? Oh. There was something about that that he likes? Nice! <laughs> I wonder what it was though. On my way to Mount Moon, still battling every trainer, I run into a Mankey. Welcome in, figurine. In Mount Moon, I head straight to the bottom floor. I desperately want a Paris. One, because they're adorable. And two, because apparently Parasect is a great Pokemon in this game. 
Both Leech Life and Mega Drain got pretty significant buffs in this game that can't go unnoticed with all of the incredible water and psychic types we'll be fighting. The encounter ends up being Zubat, uh, but it's the thought that counts. Oh, I also bought the Magikarp from that one salesman. <laughs> what a sucker. After Beanie Baby evolves, I bully a super nerd into letting me have one of his fossils. And I'm sorry guys, I've been a Kabuto fan my entire life, and I'm tired of hiding it. Also from here on, I'll only be mentioning the relevant encounters. After we arrive in Cerulean City, I'm comfortable getting closer to the level cap, and both Stamps and Pebbles get to evolve. I then check to see if I could get my free Bulbasaur, but I'm not a good trainer apparently. Go okay. What do you think, coin? Where is the light coming from behind those eyes? It's time to fight Blue again, but again, he's no big deal. His Spiro lead is dealt with by coin, figurine kicks away Rattata, Pebble eats the Bell Sprout for breakfast, and Beanie Baby uses their classic double double kick. Now am I a good trainer? Dang it! We tough it out through Nugget Bridge, and at the end of it, a trainer who's bullying their own Charmander offers them up to me. Uh, okay. Pokemon badge, you're safer here. But he's definitely not safe against Misty, who has more of an anime-based team in this game, and is all the better for it. Getting the Bulbasaur would have been nice, but Starmie is the biggest threat here, and that super effective confusion would sting. As planned, Coin does a great job in the fight, using his naturally occurring Thunder Punch to one-shot the Psyduck and Golding. But Starmie? Well, I've been in this situation before, and I don't want to risk Coin. I switch in Bugs, who just eats a Swift. Next turn, Bugs gets hit by a Bubble Beam, and takes it well enough to land a Stun Spore. Now I switch to the newly evolved Book, and the Swift crits. Now I switch to the newly evolved Eraser, and the Confusion crits. Now Eraser goes for a bite, but without the flinch or para procking, I switch into the newly evolved Pebbles. Burning low on healthy Pokemon, so Pebbles stays in and a wing attack takes Starmie to the yellow. Their confusion brings us even lower, and I don't think wing attack would get the kill. But we do have a stronger move, Razor Wind. Razor Wind is one of the many moves in this game that got buffed and had some mechanics changed. Now, instead of having 80 base power with a turn to charge and a 75% chance to land, it has 80 base power with a 100% chance to land, but needs to recharge only if it doesn't get the kill. It's kind of like a weaker Gen 1 Hyper Beam. So Pebbles shoots off the Razor Sharp Razor Wind on Starmie, leaving them with just a sliver. They're free to shoot off a Swift, and... Pebbles lives! We have to recharge this turn, but Starmie has been paralyzed the whole time. It hasn't procced once, but once is all we need. Pebble recharges, and... Starmie fires off Swift. Ending Pebble's career before it gets to fully start. I don't know what it is about Misty fights, but for some reason I just can't get through them deathless. With that, Coin tags back in to do the job that he was perhaps meant to do to begin with. One final Thunder Punch lands, and the Cascade Badge is ours. Rest in peace, Pebble. Would you like to say anything, Coin? What? Why are you excited? D did you derive joy from the death of Pebble? N no, it can't be. It's just a misunderstanding for sure. Oh, Coin uh, is happy enough for you to give me the Bulbasaur now? Okay, that's good. Badge and Stick officially join the team, and we head out to get our next encounters before Surge. The first of note is an Abra. Alakazam is hands down one of the best Pokemon in the game, and it'd be even better if the Abra didn't teleport away from us. For some reason, Coin is still rather pleased. On the bright side, I do get to catch both Puppet the Diglett from its tunnel, and Frosted Tip the Sandshrew from Route 11. I feel like Sandslash generally underperforms in these games, so I'm looking forward to using it in this one. After defeating every trainer on the SSN, Blue is once again somewhat of a pushover. I'm not complaining about the game balance or anything, I think I'm just that guy. So I enter the electric gym with switches that don't reset when you hit the wrong one, and Lieutenant Surge awaits. Now Surge is something of a gimmick boss in this game, in a good way. He only has one Raichu and nothing else. It has pretty great coverage, and is 5 levels higher than the hard level cap that the game is keeping me at. I gotta somehow take this thing down, without simply getting swept. My lead choice is Book. I could have simply led with Stick to set up statuses, but I wanted to use a different strategy from the one I used in my Fire Red video. I probably should have still just used Stick though, because Thunderbolt was probably a damage roll into killing Book. 
but he lives and gets to use his new level up move, Dig. It's only 70 base power to justify its expanded distribution, and does over half to the Raichu. Of course I don't want to lose Book, so I tag and stick hoping for a Thunderbolt, Surf, or even a Thunder Wave. Sadly though, we get the worst outcome and eat a Body Slam that paralyzes us. Well, even if it didn't para, it did do over half, so Stig won't be able to land a Stun Spore or Leech Seed anyway. This is bad because my entire strategy kinda ended up revolving around Stick. Well, thanks for taking one for the team, Puppet! Oh, we could've stayed in. Well, thanks for taking one for the team, Puppet. <laughs> Beanie Baby is now on the field with full health, and that fact lets her barely live a Thunderbolt that I'm gonna choose to believe was not a roll. Then the second level up dig is unleashed and easily takes out Raichu, winning us a not so deathless electric gym. Coin seems pretty happy about that too. And now that Beanie Baby doesn't have to worry about surfs from Raichu, I could safely use my Moonstone and get her to fully evolve. This is great because her versatility makes her one of the best Pokemon in the whole game. It's a long road to Cerulean City with many wild Pokemon and wild trainer battles along the way. However, the only encounters of note are Tamagotchi the Nidoran male on Route 9 and Idog the Growlithe on Route 8. Growlithe was pretty unfortunate here because this was technically another shot at Abra, but with Great Balls this time. And aside from a Kangaskhan that would have swept my team if it weren't for stamps, there's one other trainer of note that ends up being a huge problem. Super Nerd of Route 9. Hold up, pause, I forgot to put this in the script. On Route 9, I ran into a random trainer who had a pincer. Bugs was leading this fight, but unfortunately was no match for a crit, confusion hit, and para combo. This is the moment where the game was really ramping up, and I did not take that lesson to heart. I was feeling pretty confident around this part of the game, since my general team is pretty well balanced, but without thinking too much, I leave Stick out in front of the Super Nerds Voltorb. And of course, they end up outspeeding and landing a critical hit explosion. I'm pretty sure it's still the case in this hack that critical hits are more common the faster you are than the opponent. So, yeah. I don't even know if Beanie Baby or the freshly evolved figurine would have lived that. But, man, that sucks. And it doesn't end there. Because I thought it'd be cute if Badge went on a little rage rampage. It's got an attack boost from 20 base power to 60. But now it locks you in as if you're using Rollout or Uproar. Apparently. The Magnemite joins the fight while we're at plus two attack, and somehow lives the rage to land a Super Sonic. Not only does Badge hurt himself in confusion, but a Sonic Boom immediately after removes yet another starter from my team in the same fight. And honestly, this is more of a blow to morale than anything, but I'll take this lesson to heart. Route 7 is the last reliable chance to find an Abra in the wild. If I could get one here, then things might look up at least a little bit. And it's the puff. Alright, fine, I'll just buy one from the casino. Welcome in, Blockbuster. I also go ahead and catch Discman the Firo on Route 16, who's actually pretty good in this game too. Before I can continue my gym journey, I've got to deal with Team Rocket in a more hands-on way. I battle each and every one of the grunts in their secret hideout, only leaving me with Giovanni left who Coin seems to take a liking to. Okay, this is getting weird. Well, lucky for me, Stamps has reached his final form and has something for just about all of Giovanni's team. I was a little hesitant to evolve him, but Stone Evolutions do not miss out on attacks in this hack. Love that. Both Onyx and Kangaskhan are swiftly taken care of, and even though Stamps could probably do the same to Marowak, I didn't feel comfortable and switched to Discman. Their focus energy is nothing a little drill pack crit into fly can't handle. Persian is the last and has a little bit of coverage in Bubble Beam and Thunderbolt, so Beanie Baby tags in and just gets predicted. <laughs> Testing the AI, we stay in and get unpunished, but the double kick isn't enough to one shot. So Frost the Tip joins in and gets crit. I could send in Figurine here, but the Persian 100% outspeeds, and I don't want him taking two hits. Discman is a little iffy without being on the team too long to gain stat experience, so the job falls on Coin. All he has to do is live one hit to land a quick attack. I've been a little worried about his loyalty as of late, but I believe he could handle this. Persian uses the strongest stab takedown on the switch, but Coin eats it like a champ and finishes off the Persian with a clean quick attack. 
winning us the first bout with Giovanni. After that, I quickly head to the Grass Gym, but as I implied before, Discman is a pretty great addition to the team. Erika ends up being the first gym that gets entirely swept by a Pokemon. Her team was improved in this game, but is still no match for our bombastic bird. What do you have to say to that coin? What the? With another rival fight coming up, I realize that it's time to make a rough decision. In regards to team building in this game, it's best to finalize your team as early as possible, thanks to the stat experience. And planning for the future, with all the psychic types that'll be coming my way, it would be best if I didn't have two fighting types on the team. After thinking about it long and hard, I decide it's time to tag out stamps for Eraser. Gyarados is insane in Gen 1, especially before the physical and special split. This game is largely uncharted territory for me, so this seems like the smartest thing to do. Sorry, Stamps. And the fight against Blue finally starts. Again. And, to my surprise, this fight worried me for nothing. Coin is a menace and handily takes care of the first three Pokemon. But the first psychic Pokemon threat appears. Eraser more than proves his worth and... Oh! Oh, oh that was scary. <laughs> and bodies the Kadabra. Blue's Eevee has finally evolved into Jolteon, but Beanie Baby Being, our resident ground type, shows them what she's made of and sends the Jolteon right back into the ball. Another large number of routes now open up. Along the way, Blockbuster hits level 42 and triggers the evolution. Nice. And we finally encounter another noteworthy Pokemon. Safety Scissors, the Scyther. With that, I can now finally enter the Safari Zone. Normally, I get one encounter in each area since they can run away, but I'm not using that rule this time, because I only want one Pokemon in this place, and it only spawns in one zone. Yep, that's right. I still want Parasect. And this is my last chance to get it. After trudging through the Safari, dodging Pokemon after Pokemon, I finally make it to the West Zone. With the Dupes Claws, I have about a 50% chance to encounter Parasect. And I get Beedrill. And it flees. Blockbuster bless some blocks and sweeps the entirety of Koga's gym. Well, let's just go to Saffron City already. Wait, what's the south of Fuchsia City? Oh, oh no way. It's real? The surfing minigame is real? Oh my gosh, this is great. Maybe I don't need to worry about things becoming better, because things are okay after all. Now, I know there's a mob violently taking control of the city, but the first thing I do in Saffron is train up Discman in the fighting dojo. At the end, I'm given a choice of owning a Hitmonchan or Hitmonlee. And I leave both of them. I think Stamps would kill me if I got another fighting type. Inside Sylphco, I charge headfirst and continue my reign upon every unsuspecting grunt. My mindset here is that in order to make sure I challenge everyone, I'm just going to go floor by floor until I get the key card. Then, I go backwards to make sure I challenge everyone locked behind a door. I also vaguely remember which teleporter takes me to the rest spot, so partway through, I head there to heal my- Oh. Oh no. Oh no, I got rivaled. I actually got challenged by the rival when I wasn't ready for it. Oh no. I, I have the right Pokemon for his team, but my team is hurt and I don't have a good lead. Oh no. Figurine ends up leading into Blue's Parasect. Oh, come on! We don't have anything super effective, but I'm hoping a Mega Punch will be fine. It does do half, but a buffed Mega Drain really messes with that plan, and I preserve Vingarine by going into Discman. It's really cool that they read that and crit with a slash, but one Drill Peck takes out the first Pokemon. Gyarados is next, and there's no way Discman lives a hit from this health. So our own Eraser goes in for a Ditto match. They get a free double edge that hurts a lot, but we can't really switch here. I go for bite hoping to flinch them, but no such luck and we're brought to the red. Eraser has in fact outsped the last two turns, but at this point in the game, I'm unsure if we just got lucky with two speed ties or not. So I make the decision to switch into Beanie Baby, who could easily live a double hedge and outspeed the following turn. But believe it or not, the AI read the switch. All it took was a single Ice Beam crit, and one of my best Pokemon was removed from the picture forever. Rest in peace, BB. Coin now enters to take the kill, letting Rhyhorn enter the field. I make another huge mistake here, because normally I don't keep Pikachus out in front of Rhydons. Why would I? That's a clear death sentence, right? Well, wrong. In this game, Pikachu can learn Surf. Not only that, but I taught it to Coin. He knows Surf and can definitely outspeed and one-shot. However, I think I was so off-put by this fight even happening that I forgot 
and switched into a racer, expecting an earthquake. But Blue once again reads me and uses Body Slam to knock out another top 5 Pokemon. I'm not kidding, there are tier lists on the Legacy Discord. This isn't looking good. I don't have many options left here. I want to send in Blockbuster, but if he somehow doesn't one-shot, it'd be over for a third top 5 Pokemon in the fight. I decided not to take the chance and switch to Figurine. Figurine hasn't particularly been in the spotlight in this run, but he has for sure been a backbone off-screen. His Karate Chop then comes out and even lands a crit, but Rhydon is a crazy bulky boy. He lives and retaliates with Body Slam. And procs the Para. Man, I have to make a choice. Someone has to kill this thing and leave me in a good position to deal with Blue's Alakazam and Jolteon. With Figurine paralyzed, we don't do that job anymore. Shaken from the events that have been unfolding in front of me, I make the call to stay in. In hindsight, I probably should have switched into Discman, who would have been immune to Earthquake, and could have dodged Rock Slide or Horn Drill. But Figurine stays in, and Rhyhorn in fact lands the Horn Drill. A one-hit KO. Blockbuster now finally enters the battle. He's actually able to solo the rest of the fight, even winning with the Alakazam Ditto match. But it is such a bitter victory. Three incredible Pokemon lost in a fight that could have been easily prepped for. And even still, after all that, do I dare? Do I dare look to my side and see what coin my trusted starter Pokemon has to say? There it is. He's the happiest he's ever been, while I'm at my lowest. It turns out that I've been born in a cruel world after all, with no angel, but only a devil on my shoulder. I still have Pokemon counting on me, so I can continue for now, but I'm not sure for how much longer. Joining the team once again are Stamps and Frosted Tip. Our reunion is under negative pretext, but it's good to see them again regardless. I also add two new members. Floppy Disk, the star me I fished up from Route 19, where Coin went surfing, and tagging out Discman is Slouch Socks, the hit on Lee. I didn't plan on this, but welcome in, guys. Of course, I could add the male Nita Rand from earlier to replace Beanie Baby, but it honestly wouldn't feel right. After having the most stressful blue fight in my life, the upcoming Giovanni fight feels like nothing. Coin enjoys the thrill of murder and knocks out his Kingler. Stamps proves himself as one of the OGs and takes out Kangaskhan. Floppy Disk debuts and shows Machoke and Golem, who's also in the top 5. And finally, Slouch Sock enters to show off a buffed rolling kick and one-shots the Ace Persian. Sabrina is terrifying on paper, with a team full of Psychic types that all know Psychic, believe it or not. But luckily for me, I've got the perfect counter. With a buffed Twin Needle, Safety Scissors joins the team and sweeps all of Sabrina's Pokemon. Good job, buddy! Back to the box! Unsurprisingly, Blaine is a pretty similar story. His Rapid Ash is probably the biggest threat with its higher crit chances thanks to its buff speed. But Stamps lifts two high jump kicks and retaliates with an Earthquake to honor Beanie Baby and then a Karate Chomp to clean up. With Charizard in play, I don't want Stamps taking a wing attack, so I send in Floppy Disk. They take a crit slash like a champ and I decide to play it safe by using Recover. I might as well take them out with higher health, right? The problem is that this line of reasoning only really works if we don't get crit six times in a row. Well, now I guess we'll just take it out with a surf and... Oh, <laughs> well, uh, now we should absolutely recover. After receiving three more crits, I just call it and finally take them down. Ninetales luckily doesn't live the surf and Arcanine scares me into healing, but he doesn't live a hit either. Finally is Magmar, who got a boost to its special stat, which, friendly reminder, occupies both the roles of special attack and special defense. That's why Blockbuster is so good. We dish out more than they can chew, and the Volcano Badge is all ours. With seven badges firmly in hand, the team and I finally get back to Viridian City and challenge the eighth and final gym leader. No. No way! Giovanni is the 8th gym leader? He leads with a very speedy Doug Trio, but Floppy Disk is even speedier. The thing is though, I don't think the one shot is guaranteed, 
And that's bad because they have the one-shotting Fissure. Luckily, we do end up getting the kill after all, and Nidoqueen comes in. Surprisingly, another Surf gets another kill. Persian Thunderbolts and Hyper Beam are scarier than ever now. So Slouch Socks comes in to... Eat a Bubble Beam. Wow, I really do not know anything, huh? They then go for Thunderbolt for some reason, and Slouch Sock gets the kill the same way he did last time. Nido King is pretty scary with its nuke of a moveset and seemingly random AI, so I decided to leave Slouch Sock in here to hopefully get some damage off. They end up using Thunder, but Slouch isn't no slouch, and tanks it well enough to land a critical mega kick. Good job, buddy! With how well he took it, I believe he could take another, and believe it or not, the following sludge does not kill. And we retaliate with a rolling kick to take them down. We do get poisoned, but in Gen 1, if you get the kill, the tick damage doesn't activate. Rhydon is the final Pokemon, but Frosted Tip has spent the entire run thus far dealing with Pokemon like him, and easily takes them down with a couple earthquakes. We won the 8th and final badge. Well, Coin, we did pretty well earning those badges, don't you think? Yeah. There of course is one more fight against Blue before the Elite Four, but we handle it pretty easily. I couldn't help but feel like he was going easy on us after our last match. Pitying me, but in a way that made him feel better about himself. I don't like that, but I knew I'd be seeing him again sometime very soon. Victory Road has many trainers that have all been given team and AI buffs. And just like the rest of the game, I make sure to challenge all of them. The stat experience is great, but I'm also doing it for the money. <laughs> The Indigo Plateau sells TMs, and I want to be sure to get what I need. On the way though, I realize that an opportunity has been presented to me. Although Discman has been on the team since Erica, and done a great job, I know that his special stat is rather low, with many special oriented Pokemon ready and waiting in the Elite Four. I've had 8 deaths so far in this run, and would hate to lose anyone else. With that in mind, Discman agrees to tag out, and let me encounter the Moltres, just sitting in Victory Road. It's what's best for the team. I feel like whenever I use legendaries and nuzlocks, I should try to justify it a little bit, and this time is no different. Well, here I go. In Yellow Legacy, both Zapdos and Articuno are blocked by trainers with a full team of Pokemon at level 55. This is so that, even if you get there earlier in the game, you still have to prove yourself to get the legendary, in a way. Maltres, however, here in Victory Road, has no such custom boss trainer. And with all the game's balances and redistributions of moves and Pokemon locations, it seems to me like it's okay to catch the Moltres. Oh, oh, and look at that! It ranks under Charizard! There you have it, folks. After finally making it to the Indigo Plateau, I make all the preparations I need. Potions, TMs, and whatever stat medicine I could give Game Boy with the remaining money. With that, as you could probably guess, I'll be bringing Stamps, Frosted Tip, Blockbuster, Floppy Disk, Game Boy, and as usual, Coin. I wanted to keep most of the main team intact for this, and I think that they'll do a pretty good job. Let's do this. Lorelei is the first of the gauntlet, and Coin leads with a strong Thunderbolt against her Slowbro that doesn't kill, but fully paralyzes. This was a crazy first turn because Slowbro does in fact have Earthquake, but honestly I think Coin could have taken it. Cloyster and Dugong are next, but Coin takes them both out just as easily, even after a Blizzard. Jinx is a Pokemon that actually has the potential to ruin everything though. Coin is definitely not the play here, so I switch to Floppy Disk who resists all of their moves. But unfortunately, they go for the 100% accurate Lovely Kiss to put us to sleep. Several turns later, we finally wake up, but can't do anything that turn because of Gen 1. So next turn, we take the time to heal off the damage with a Recover, only to get put back to sleep again. In order to break this cycle, Blockbuster comes in on a Bubble Beam. We then land a Thunder Wave, only to get put to sleep the next turn. I really don't know why I go for these kinds of strats. I saw how well that worked out against Misty. Blockbuster doesn't take the hits from Jinx nearly as well without resisting the attacks, so while he's asleep, I go back to Floppy Disk. But this whole thing was a bad play after all, because I forgot that sleep turns reset if you switch out. Floppy Disk then gets too low to stay in anymore, so I switch to Game Boy for their debut. Jinx reads us with a bubble beam, but we tank it like a champ and get the kill with the flamethrower. Lapras comes out last and tanks the flamethrower themselves, only to miss a sing, which lets Game Boy fire off a second flamethrower, finally winning us the fight. Look, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe there's a part of me that truly can't help but overcomplicate things sometimes. Bruno is second in the Elite Four, 
but once again, Blockbuster busts some blocks and one-shots most of his Pokemon. Man, Alakazam is pretty much a legendary in these games. Onyx enters the field, and with the buffs, I do not want to risk anything. So Floppy Disk comes back out to finish... Okay, well, even still, a Psychic is more than enough for the Machamp. Nice! Oh man, Bruno's so embarrassed, he can't even look at me. Next is Bertha. However, we all know that the first two Pokemon's blocks will in fact be busted, leaving Marowak to come in. Now, her block could also feasibly be bustable, but with no need to take the risk, Stamps tags in to do the job just as well. Not only that, but his Earthquake is just as deadly, taking out the Arbok. Last is Agatha's fastest Gengar, but seeing as three of the Gengar's four moves are super effective into Stamps, and the fourth move being the only one that Blockbuster is afraid of, I predicted that it would be safe for him to come in. After an evidently safe switch, Blockbuster then outspeeds the Gengar and busts a final block. And I hate to say it, but with the help of Floppy Disk, Lance is kind of a pushover. His lead Dragonite is outsped and one-shot by Ice Beam. His Gyarados is outsped and one-shot by Thunderbolt. His Charizard is outsped and one-shot by Surf. His Aerodactyl is outsped and one-shot by Surf. And his final Dragonite is, get this, outsped and one-shot by Ice Beam. This fight could have been pretty crazy without Floppy Disk's help, but honestly, I think Stamps would have been fine too. Any closing thoughts, Coin? I think he knows that victory is nigh. All throughout the game, I've belittled Blue, only for him to get his payback over in Silphco, seemingly with Coin cheering him on. But now, with my team made specifically to counter his, it's instead time for him to get his just desserts. The final match starts with a mirror match starring Blockbuster and Blue's Alakazam. We take the first turn to paralyze them with Thunder Wave, and it pays off right away with them getting fully paralyzed. We then land a pretty strong Psychic, with them landing their own Thunder Wave. But we're already two steps ahead of them. Things could go wrong here if we get fully parried and they start setting up double teams and recovers, but our Paraluck has finally bounced back and the opposing Alakazam is unable to retaliate. Rhyhorn is another Pokemon with RNG as a potential threat. Horn Drill is 100% a possibility, but Stamps comes in only to eat an Earthquake. After easily surviving the hit, he fires off a of Surf to delete the Rhino from the game. Gyarados is more than likely going to use the super effective Fly, so I switch in Coin to fight the... Coin barely lives, but with a near-death experience to take home with him. This whole time, Coin's teammates have been falling one by one as he watches on the sidelines. After living a Hyper Beam that he almost certainly shouldn't have, he finally understood what everyone else was working towards. The whole team wanted to get our own little Pikachu through the Elite Four safely. And he took them for granted. While Gyarados is recharging, Coin fires off his strongest Thunderbolt yet, taking out one of the biggest threats in the entire game. Great job, little guy. I knew you'd come around. Arcanine is out, but poses very little threat to Floppy Disk, who switches spots with Coin. A single dig is nowhere near enough, and the following Surf finishes the job with ease. Executor enters the field, but without a status move like Stun Spore or Leech Seed, all it could do is watch in horror as Game Boy joins the fight and eats the palm tree for breakfast. Last is Blue's starter Pokemon, Jolteon, but Frosted Tip has been on the team this whole time for this specific reason. As he enters the fight, Jolteon sets up a double team, which could prove pretty poorly for us. The following turn, they outspeed us to use a headbutt that gets a crit and we miss an earthquake. Oh no. <laughs> could things really fall apart from here? Well, the answer is a resounding no, because after they land their following headbutt, Frosted Tip lands his Earthquake after all, and takes down Blue's Jolteon, winning us the champion fight and the entirety of Pokemon Yellow Legacy. This is probably a hot take, but Yellow Legacy just might be peak. I've never once planned on going back to Gen 1, with its move distribution and stat spreads and so on, but this ROM hack has brought the best out of these games in every way possible. 
Don't get me wrong, the, the original Pokemon games were amazing for the time, but in the modern day, I usually find so many other reasons to play the other games instead. But wow, this was a blast. To the team that worked on this game, amazing job. I cannot wait to play Crystal and Emerald Legacy after this. You guys did great. And if you guys can't wait to watch more Nuzlocks, feel free to check out my other videos on this channel with many more to come. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, it'd really mean a lot if you left a like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps out the channel by letting YouTube know that it's got your seal of approval. Also, thank you to... Raul for becoming and continuing to be the channel member. I forgot this part last week, don't tell anyone. Well anyways, that's about all I've got for today. Thank you all so much for watching, especially if you've made it to the end. I'll see you guys next time, and have a good one.